have to take the Wellington Revolution Conference, I'm sure people are exhausted. So we, we all are, so uh, yeah, well, thank you for coming. Um, so we've got uh, four readers, uh, Matthias, uh, this is the order that we're competing. Uh, Matthias, Julie, Christine, and Jennifer. Okay, so we'll start uh, with Matthias Wiedner. That's the correct pronunciation. Yeah, it is. Good. It is very good. Uh, he's a writer, artist, and critic who teaches at CalArts. He's one of three members of the art collective Fallen Fruit, which has exhibited internationally in Mexico, Colombia, Denmark, Austria, in uh, Arts Electronica, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Yerba Buena Center for, Center for the Arts of San Francisco, and the Arco 2010 in Madrid. Uh, he writes regularly on Art for Art, Us and Extra and has been published in Cabinet, Journal of Aesthetics and Protest, Radical History Review and Black Clock and is the co-editor with Christian Wertheim of Seance and the Nulopian oh, Analects. Is that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, his book of experimental fiction is forthcoming from the Fig Press. So, Matthias. It's always an interesting question, maybe more so for gay people. Two, I taught my queer books class today, so it's a question that came up, but it's a question that won't go away either, and not just for gay people. Three, there are a whole set of my mother's recipes that I lost or actually never even wrote them down. Four, I kind of did it on purpose. Five, I thought maybe if I could recreate them, they would seem less special and less haunting. Six, one thing about teaching is when you teach the same book again, and then a third time, etc. Seven, the same book is different. Eight, you see a book is not one thing, it's many things in an arrangement. Not nine, I always forget if I write the numbers or not, like the number, I don't hear the numbers when I read them anymore. Um, nine, and you don't see all the things, or see them evenly even when that arrangement is simple or narrative. 10. In high school, they trained us to read the New York Times. They didn't just explain how articles were placed and what it meant, but they showed us the tricky eight-part fold so you could read the whole thing seated on a crowded subway. 11. They were planning on us being successful, but maybe not so successful we wouldn't have to take the subway. 12. In Frascati, Italy, you buy roast pork off the spit from one old merchant, and then you take it to a wine place where they keep your glass filled with beautiful white wine. Frascati, it's called, from the bow. Thirteen. There are two kinds of teachers. Researchers, always looking for something new, and rehearsers, who repeat the same things, maybe in hopes of seeing something new. Fourteen. When you read a book more than once, you see the mechanics of that book. 
15, my mother didn't actually love to cook. She just did it really well. 16, when you desire someone, there is always a difference between what you think you're getting and what you get. 17, once my boyfriend and I went to visit my parents, and we discovered we both had crabs. We washed everything and got the special soap, but I decided I should tell my mother in any case. She was fine with it. She said, during the war, everyone had crabs. 18. Of course, at rush hour, everyone takes the subway. It's the fastest way to get around. 19. When I'm writing 25 random things, I don't think about overall structure. I think either about the sentence or about variety. 20. In a relationship, you get A. More than you want. B. Less. Or C. Other than what you expected. 21. David and Austin don't really understand how little other newspapers mean to me and how much the New York Times means to me. 22. I know this is kind of pathetic. 23. I wonder if private but public events will change because of Facebook. 24. Rick Moody's wife had a baby, and everyone is leaving him congratulations on his page, <laughs> often congratulating him, but not her. Is that because it's not her page? 25. All the really successful New Yorkers work until 9 or 10, and then get driven home in a limousine. 2,500 random things about me, too. 3. One, all day today, I've been thinking of the expression, don't hock me at China. It means stop yammering or nagging me. Three, I looked it up, and hock, you've heard, to nag, but also to bang on something. And china is a tea kettle. Stop banging on the kettle. Four, Kenny Goldsmith says, if it's not in the New York Times, it doesn't exist. Five, these are the Yiddish expressions that were used in my family. Nu, nash, oive, oivival, schlep, and gone. Six, meat memory. I can remember when I needed to be talked into eating meat as a child. Also with friends' kids, like Camille, I remember persuading them to eat their meat. Seven, it's a thing carried from generation to generation. Eight, but somewhere in the beginning there must have been someone who got over their disinclination to rubbery texture gristle and fat, not to mention the woeful eye of their prey looking up at them. Nine, and funny that for so long, so few have broken that chain. Ten, no, I'm an omnivore. Eleven, once in August, Andy and I went up to the house in the mountains and laid on the deck at night to watch the cursed meteor shower. Twelve, it was freezing, bone chilling cold, the sky was calmed with shooting stars. Thirteen, a gunner is like a swindler, a frog. Fourteen, there are other kinds of meat memory, which is what your body remembers. Illness, wounds, being, sex, memory of place. The only thing I remember about visiting Berlin as a kid is the Gedächtniskirche. Bombed up church, it kept that way, as a war memorial and seeing bullet holes in buildings that still weren't patched, especially one street in Albert Einstein's house. 16. Only my brother and I, with our Argentine passports, were allowed into East Berlin for a tour. My parents couldn't go. 17. As I said to Russell Swenson earlier, scratch a boy to get his money. And Russell Swenson had many people who responded. 18. Peggy just fell off the sofa. Peggy's my dog who was um, 14 and, and died of cancer. Um, Peggy just fell off the sofa. 19. I'm not sure I can convey my parents' joy when sometime in the 80s they received passports that in place of any one country said European, European, European Union in three languages. 20. In college, I worked for a while for Eric Bentley who was a playwright and a translator of Bertolt Brecht's plays. He taught at Columbia, but resigned in solidarity with the student protesters in 1968. I must have gotten a job through a campus listing. 21. 
He was in his 60s at least, and he had to do paperwork. Shim, soon he started showing me Polaroids of black hustlers he brought home sometimes. 22. One I will never forget because he had a white athletic sock hanging over his cock while he smiled at the camera. 23. Another time with Camille, we had to go through her hair with a knit comb and wash everything in hot water because she picked up head lice at summer camp. 24. And then they came back. 25. Her scalp was so irritated she cried from the comb. I offered to stop and she said, no, do it. 2,500 random things about me. One, I once had sex with a prostitute in Kevin Killian and Tendoni Bellamy's apartment. Two, he only told me he was a prostitute after we had sex. <laughs> I met him in a club in San Francisco. He was in a band that had just played called the Popstitutes. <laughs> Apparently, everyone in the band was a prostitute. <laughs> Three, these are all true. I mean, about me. I mean, I did do things like that. Um, Three, sometimes people's comments on my random things are better than my random things. Four, I had just been told by an ex that I had scabies and had to go to a clinic to get the right soap to kill them. I washed all the sheets and told Kevin and Dilly not to worry, but I could tell they were a little worried. <laughs> this wasn't the first, but it may have been the second time I ever stayed with them. Five, I was much younger than that. Six, the video card on my laptop was giving out, and just now the corner of the page I'm writing lifted or blacked out, and then came back again. Seven. I think during the same visit, Doty and Eileen Miles, who were staying there too, had a terrible screaming fight, which both of them wrote about later. <laughs> Eight, they did. Um, Eight. I think actually the club where the prostitutes were playing was called the Clubstitute. <laughs> <laughs> Nine, a while ago, I saw a video on YouTube of an elephant painting itself or painting another elephant. Ten, there are a lot of videos like this with people staring on in amazement. Eleven, I think this is about us, not the elephants. Our pleasure at seeing the elephants reflecting on themselves is really about our desire to see ourselves reflected. Twelve, oh, the foolish cult of Matthew Barney. 13. It seems I'm about a third of the way through now. It doesn't feel any definite way, though. I'm still just writing sentences. Gail came out of sentences, which I thought was really strange in my own. 14. I never try to know what's coming next. 15. There are in Yiddish two words that mark an important distinction that exists in no other language. The Shlemiel and the Shlemavo. Two kinds of unlucky or klutzy people. But in the spilling of a bowl of soup, the shlemiel will inevitably be the one who spills it, and the shlemazo is the one who gets it spilled on him. <laughs> Sixteen. No one I know will ever confess to reading or liking a self-help book, but I actually love the power of now. Seventeen. I remember once suddenly noticing the backs of people's heads, their hair, in a classroom or a theater. 18. It might have been after getting glasses or contact lenses. 19. Suddenly every hair was visible. A whole head of hair, one by one, and lots of heads, a whole room of heads of hair. 20. Another in that line of recognitions was when I first saw Jean Dunning's photographs of women's hair. You looked at it and you thought, wow, every hair counts. 22. The thing about eyes that interests me is they both see and they are looked at, often intensely. I remember my mother once said to me, we're not German, we're European. You reach a certain point in your life and you look back and if not find forgiveness, you come up with a new concept of need. Your parent, your ex, or the driver of the car that hit you wasn't doing anything but what they needed to do at the time. 25. So you kind of put need in the place of either intention 